Welcome everyone to the Full Spectrum Series. My name is Nick Valentino. I am an Assistant Director in the Hagem School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. I will be your host for the series. Um, this is the third year of the Full Spectrum Series where we invite faculty to discuss and explain their fields in an effort to inform and educate prospective and current students, parents, alums, uh, on the problems that computer scientists and engineers are trying to solve. Uh, our guest today is Dr. Michael Scott. Uh, Dr. Scott earned his PhD from the University of Wisconsin uh, in medicine. He is an Arthur Gould Yates Professor and Chair of Computer Science. Uh, Dr. Scott was recognized for his distinguished efforts to advance science by the world's largest multidisciplinary scientific society, the Association for the Advancement of Science. The Association for, uh, for Computing Machinery recognized Dr. Scott for, for the influence research has had on modern computing and awarded him the Edsger W. Dykstra Prize in Distributed Computing. He also won the Hagem School Lifetime Achievement Award. Dr. Scott, I could go on. Uh, there is more stuff I know, but then we would not have any time for computer science. Uh, thank you for agreeing to do this and talk to us a little bit more about your field. My pleasure. Did I get most of that right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, that one's fine. <laughs> thank you so much. So computer science is, is easily one of the most popular majors um, that we have at the college. Can, can you go into a little bit more uh, of an overview of what computer science is? I have just a few slides that Great. maybe will be helpful for people who like to see things visually at the same time that uh, that they're hearing it. Uh, so as uh, as you just pointed out, I'm currently serving as chair of the CS department. I've been here since like 1985, uh, which seems like uh, since the dinosaurs roamed the <laughs> earth, but it's been a wonderful ride. It's been a great place to be. Uh, my research is in parallel computing, as you might guess from, um, from some of the intro. Um, and I'm assuming that anybody who's watching this is interested in computer science for one reason or another, and, uh, and is probably aware of how much computing has changed the world over the past like 75 years since the first electronic computers were invented, and especially the last 25 years since the World Wide Web appeared and the internet has transformed just about everything we do. So, you know, business, government, industry, media, entertainment, the arts, social interaction, computing has really transformed all of that. When I was an undergrad, CS was much narrower than it is today. Nowadays, it attracts um, a huge range of students and interacts with pretty much every other field of human endeavor. Half of our CS majors are actually double or even triple majors specializing in computing and something else. And the something else's are all over the map, you know, uh, psychology, economics and business, studio art, English, physics, philosophy, biology, foreign language, math, you name it. We have double majors in all of these fields. Um, we aim to be, quite frankly, the best small CS department in the country. Uh, we have roots in research. We were founded in 1974 as a PhD only department, but over the years we've grown to embrace undergraduate and professional master's education as well. Uh, and our goal remains to pursue the very best possible education and research on a personal scale. Uh, we have 19 tenure track faculty right now, five instructional faculty, about 600 undergraduate majors and about 100 graduate students. Um, by comparison, the, the median size of the top 50 CS departments in the country is about 45 tenure track lines, so well over twice our size. Um, there is no department our size or smaller that is ranked above us by U.S. News at this point. Um, we're now, as you mentioned, one of the most popular majors at the university, um, roughly one in every 10 undergraduates majors in CS, maybe with some additional majors as well. About a third of our undergraduates are women, which is almost twice the national average, though it's still not the 50% that it ought to be. Um, half of our undergrads were born outside the U.S., which is high for the university, which is already high compared to other universities. Um, our graduates pursue an incredibly wide range of careers. Many, of course, become professional programmers in the computing industry. They go to Google and Apple and Amazon and Meta and Microsoft and dozens of smaller companies. 
Others go into business and finance or healthcare or nonprofit agencies or various sorts of government service. Some of them start their own companies. Some go on to grad school, either in computer science or in some allied field. To support this really huge range of students and careers and interests, we have a very flexible undergraduate program. We offer both a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science degree. The BS is the hardcore tech degree. Uh, the BA is for double majors and people with strong interests in allied fields. Whether you're doing the BA or the BS, there's a two course intro sequence, 171 and two, which is Java programming and then data structures and algorithms. And those two courses are similar to what's offered at, at many schools. Uh, we also require everybody to take a discrete math course. That's the math of countable things as opposed to the math of continuous functions. The BS degree continues with um, 173, which is basically about all the ways in which formal, rigorous, logical systems support practice in different fields of computer science. And then um, five core courses, two in the theory of computing, um, two in computer systems, and one in artificial intelligence. And then for the BS, four upper level electives. The BA is much less structured. It has the same three intro courses and then almost any nine uh, additional courses. There's some restrictions there, but um, for the most part, students can plan their own curriculum for the BA. Uh, they end up with a total of three fewer required courses than the BS and fewer restrictions, which makes it appealing to people who are trying to fit in time for other majors. Um, for both the BA and the BS, there are also writing requirements that the university sets up, and um, there are clusters of three coherent courses that everybody has to take in the humanities and in the social sciences. And by the way, we, we differ from the other engineering departments in that CS requires both humanities and social science clusters, where in the other engineering departments, you get to choose one or the other. Um, for humanities and social science students, of course, we also offer clusters in computer science for people who are majoring in other fields. And a lot of students choose to extend those clusters into six course minors. Uh, lots of our undergrads also get involved in research. Uh, several each year opt to complete a senior honors thesis, which is a really rigorous research oriented degree. Many of those senior honors theses result in published papers in conferences and journals. I've listed on this slide the principal areas of research within the department. There's three broad fields, um, theory, AI, and systems. And I've listed sub areas for each of those that I'm not gonna go into here, but and would be happy to answer any questions about. But Roughly, theory is about formal foundations of computing, what's possible and impossible, what's easy and what's fundamentally hard, what reasoning methods can help us specify what we want, build algorithms to achieve it and prove that we got it right. AI and HCI are about how to interact well with human beings and how to emulate or even surpass behaviors that we consider intelligent when they're displayed by human beings. Uh, much of the recent work in AI involves deep neural networks and machine learning. Uh, those are the things that have enabled speech recognition and translation, image and video analysis, the Facebook news feed, chatbots, augmented and virtual reality, uh, deep fakes and targeted disinformation, and all sorts of other stuff, both good and bad. Uh, that's really changing the world and is going to do so even more over the next few years. And then finally, systems, which, of course, is my area. I like to describe as everything you need on your computer before you can use it for anything you care about. <laughs> so that's, that's the hardware design, the operating system, programming languages, development tools, databases, networking, security, fault tolerance, energy efficiency, all of that uh, falls under systems. And, and with that, uh, I will stop presenting slides and would be happy to deal with questions that have come from students or, or from you, Nick. Uh, 
Yeah, that, that was, was excellent. I, I'm thinking about all the things that you know and have designed that I haven't identified or know how they work on my computer. So I appreciate <laughs> you being here and knowing, and knowing which part is most well yours. Although I will share that my wife bought me for Christmas a t-shirt once that I love to wear that says, no, I do not know what's wrong with your computer. <laughs> You're like, yes, just because I know everything goes in doesn't mean I can, or that I want to fix your computer too. Uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about misconceptions. So sure. what the currently is the biggest misconception about computer science and what can we do to counter that? The biggest misconception about computer science is what David Patterson used to call the Jurassic Park effect. Uh, you remember the computer scientist in Jurassic Park? This is the the the, the geeky, overweight guy who um, <laughs> ate pizza all the time. It was yeah. trying to steal the dinosaur genes, and eventually, uh, he's the one who lets the dinosaurs loose, and, and everything goes bad. But there's this social idea, largely reinforced by media, that computer scientists sit in a lab somewhere and write code all day, which could not be farther from the truth. They are embedded in every single field uh, of society and academia these days. And uh, the typical computer scientist spends much more time working with human beings than they do with computers. They're simply using the computers to do something cool uh, in whatever environment they're embedded in. So one of the upper level uh, writing possibilities has, in the past has been, uh, you know, issues in computer science that you can talk about. I know the makeup of those courses can be different, but uh, whether they are, you know, sophomore, junior or senior, can you talk about how uh, students and undergraduates seem to react to those topics and, and what is sort of the outcome of those courses uh, yeah, so uh, you're, you're kind of hitting on two things here. There's the writing requirement, and there's also the social implications and ethics um, component of the curriculum. Uh, and, and those can go together, but they don't have to. So for the upper level writing requirement at the university, our department accepts almost any of the writing intensive courses in any department to help satisfy that requirement. And we have um, several courses in CS that are specifically designed to fulfill the writing requirement. Um, one of those is a, a nurturing your or cultivating your professional identity course, which goes into writing cover letters and resumes and stuff. Another one is the machines and consciousness course that Professor Schubert teaches. Uh, another one, which I think is what you were talking about, is the social implications of computing course, which is a discussion and essay oriented course about all the ways that computing is changing the world. And it touches on security and privacy and anonymity and free speech and surveillance and changes to the workforce and risk concentration, computer crime, intellectual property, um, just a, a wide host of topics. Uh, there's discussion and readings. And the goal of the course really is just to get students to think about these issues because so much of the impact of computing depends on design decisions that engineers are making early in the design process. And we need to get them thinking about what the impact is gonna be. Just as a simple example, we stumbled in the 1990s into um, a payment regime for the internet where ads pay for everything. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to do that. It was sort of a technical decision that people designing the software made early on, they said, we're not gonna charge a fee for this service. We're not gonna make it, you know, cost you a hundredth of a cent every time you visit a web page and then send that money to the people who maintain the web page. Instead, we're gonna pay advertisers, or uh, sorry, we're gonna let advertisers pay for the page uh, because they want your eyeballs. <laughs> and because of that, <laughs> um, websites are intensely focused on keeping you on the site and looking at the ads because they're getting paid for every minute. Um, they're getting paid by the advertisers for every minute you stay on that page. And it didn't take long for the social media sites to discover that the more extreme the content, the more controversial the ideas, the more it makes you angry, the more you stay on the site. So they have this strong financial incentive to show you awful stuff. Yeah. 
often stuff that isn't true, that feeds into political polarization. And that technical decision about how to pay for websites made 25 years ago is kind of like breaking democracy today. <laughs> so we have to really be thinking about this stuff. Yeah, I mean, it seems sort of parallel to our news issues too, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You know, having it, you know, if we're in a position when they did set up network news to say, okay, you can't sell any advertisements during this hour, would we be in a different scenario than, than we are now? Uh, it's sort of in that vein, we, you know, at U of R, we get a lot of students who come in and say, you know, uh, who, I want to save the world. Which is, and I think since COVID uh, in, in quarantine, I think that is also sort of increased and fueled. Now, yep. uh, a few years ago, when we were able to have our uh, outdoor ceremony during commencement, you gave a really great speech about the responsibility of computer science scientists and the power that they they wield, right? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the idea of like that you had about you know how the best of intentions uh, can go awry, and that the idea that how much power computer scientists have. Uh, when they leave here and an understanding of that. Yeah, well, if you think about what the internet has done, it's allowed people to reestablish contact with long lost friends, to find people with similar interests. Uh, it allows people in all sorts of historically marginalized groups to find other people that they feel akin to and can provide mutual support for. Uh, it uh, it's enabled democracy movements in countries around the world. Uh, it's done all sorts of wonderful things. It's made all sorts of new businesses possible, but it has also led to increased, you know, bullying and um, poorer mental health for teenagers. It's led to political polarization. Um, it's led to the demise of brick and mortar small stores in people's downtowns. And there's all sorts of things that ha have, have worked the other direction. And we need to be thinking about these as we develop the new technologies. Um, many people recently may have seen what can be done with AI and video editing now. We can feed just a verbal prompt into a computer system and get photorealistic images for what you just described, right? You know, give me something that looks like a photograph of that politician I hate shooting somebody, <laughs> or, you know, the cover for my new book, or, you know, there's all <laughs> sorts of wonderful uses and all sorts of bad uses. And we need to think about how we're going to inoculate society so that people come to understand that just because you see a picture doesn't mean it's real. I, I, I spent, I'm, I'm 45, so I spent about 18 years of my life, I guess, uh, analog for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. and then 10 years of watching this, and then the next rest of the time spending putting stuff in, in clouds, right? So I, I, my question is, is that uh, what are the perspectives and strengths of different generations of computer scientists, right? So you saw this okay. from a young age and then developed so fast but are also in a position to shape new computer scientists. So, so how does how do the different generations look at computer science? What are some of the benefits? What are some of the drawbacks? Well, students have changed a lot over time. Um, they're growing up in a different world. They're computer literate, or at least accustomed to working with digital devices from the earliest age these days. So, you know, once upon a time, I had students who were afraid to work with a computer because they thought they might break something, you know, I don't want to touch that key. I don't know what will happen. Now everybody is used to just poke at it and see what it does. And, uh, you know, by trial and error, I'll figure it out, which is, for the most part, a very healthy change that allows people to, to move through things more quickly and to experiment and to learn. One of the really nice things about computing is that for the most part, you can't break anything by poking at it. Unlike say mechanical engineering, right? <laughs> I like to joke, we don't have to worry about which end of the soldering iron do you hold. You're not gonna burn yourself. <laughs> um, I do worry about attention spans these days. People in general have shorter attention spans. I have a shorter attention span than I used to it. I'm aware of that. Uh, that's part of our, our modern digital life, and it, it impacts how courses work in every department at the university. Um, when I was going into college, I remember my father said, don't go into computing. Mm. 
He said, the field is changing so fast, there's no way you'll stay up to date. You'll be an anachronism by the time you're 40. And I said, oh, dad, don't worry. I'm going to be one of the people who's, you know, advancing the field, <laughs> which was a incredibly stuck up thing to say when I was 18 <laughs> years old. Uh, it did, by good fortune, turn out largely to be true. And I have been right <laughs> um, with the vanguard of the field for uh, for the course of my career. But I can tell I'm slowing down, you know, and, uh, <laughs> there are things that I still do in ways that I learned when I was in college. And my younger colleagues look at me and say, dude, why? <laughs> why don't you switch to this new technology? <laughs> and of course, my students are switching to it very quickly. <laughs> So, sounds, yeah, the, the field is changing and people adapt, but uh, uh, there's limits. <laughs> and, I catch uh, some of this. I, I, I with like, not having new blood. <laughs> I catch some of this with the idea of like tabs versus spaces and things like that, where like people have such preferences based upon how they were taught. I, I, I wanted to talk to you about uh, there used to be uh, a, a, a tug of war, at least in my understanding, between electrical and computer engineering students and computer science students. I think we kind of have a sort of a three-way tug of war if you add data science in terms of all having students that, you know, they may have an interest in one of those or many of those, yep. but don't know which one to go to. Can you talk a little bit about the differences and in, in sure, sure. will win that tug of war? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I wouldn't call it a tug of war because the three programs here at the U of R work so closely together all the time. And, uh, you know, we've got several CS faculty who have secondary appointments in electrical and computer engineering and vice versa. Roughly half of the CS faculty is affiliated with the Data Science Institute, and uh, you know, we're the largest contingent of people in data science, although data science spans about 20 departments. Uh, the fields are related, but they aren't the same. So the difference between ECE and computer science is largely, though not entirely, um, hardware versus software. Mm -hmm. So um, at the U of R and at many schools, ECE is the hardware side of computing and, um, and computer science is the software side. That's not completely true. You know, we have people in CS who do some hardware design. I've done some. We have people in ECE, of course, who are writing software because they need it for their research. Uh, and in some cases, because it is a focus of their research. But to first approximation, think of ECE as the hardware and computer science as the software. <laughs> Data science is a newer discipline that the world is in the process of defining. Um, and there isn't a universally agreed upon definition of the term yet. Uh, and it and how it gets defined varies some from place to place. Personally, I like to say data science is all about what you can do with huge quantities of almost arbitrary data that may be in multiple places of varying quality, collected in different ways, structured in different ways, um, updated at different speeds, but you want to learn something from it. Mm -hmm. You may not even know exactly what you want to learn. The question may be, what could I learn from this? What is it, What information is hidden in this data and how do I harness it? How do I do summarization across it? How do I sample things from it in order to accomplish some interesting task in the world, like understand how my business works or what my students' needs are or what the climate is going to look like 10 years from now? Um, that's part of data science and the other part, so that's sort of the statistical understand the data side. The other part of data science is how do we actually manage this? There's so much of it and it's spread across geographic boundaries. You know, it's on every continent, but I want to use it and it takes a lot of time to send it over wires. So I want to send some computation to where the data is. I want to curate it. I want to understand where it came from. These are sort of practical systems issues in data management. So it, it's both um, kind of the, the AI understand what we can learn from the data and the systems understand how to manage the data components together that make data science from my perspective. I, you know, you mentioned this a bit in the slides and, and I've had this experience with both computer science and, and data science students uh, that, you know, the additional coursework in their choosing, whether it be their clusters or area concentration, you know, is so like, where do you want to use this power? Like, what do you care about outside mm -hmm. of computer science that you want to do? And, and I feel like that's been very valuable in, in understanding the context of things. 
Um, we had a data science project that we worked with uh, in the students. Uh, we're looking back at you know performance in 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 academics and everything, and, and they came to us and like, why did every uh, study abroad student have a 0, 0.0 grade grade average? And we're like, well, okay, come on in. We're going to tell you all about higher ed and how they do transfer credit and everything like that. So I found that like it, you know the more knowledge that you have within your field, both in computer science and where you want to apply this, is one of the things that we're sort of offering. Yes. Um... I want to offer a caveat there, sort of unsolicited advice for any students who are watching this, and that is don't overthink it. Mm -hmm. Don't stress out too much about what you're going to major in. Don't stress out too much about exactly which courses are going to serve you for your career. Do what you enjoy. Mm -hmm. Do what you're passionate about. Study what you find fascinating and personally fulfilling, and that will lead to a good career. Um, it's absolutely not the case that somebody in data science versus somebody in computer science as a major has locked themselves into constrained career paths and precluded moving into one thing or the other after they graduate. They haven't. Um, almost any job that one of our data science students could be a candidate for, the CS student could be a candidate for as well, and vice versa. There's a difference in emphasis but it doesn't close things off. So make your decisions based on, uh, on what you're passionate about rather than on you know, what you think is gonna get you the right job after you finish. So in, in other of the full spectrum interviews, I've been asking this question, and now this is the first time I think I'm asking and understand what I'm really asking. Uh, we wanna talk about the next big thing or big wave in your field. And I, and I think the way that I'm, I, I, the question I'm asking is what is, something that the fewest amount of people are working on that has the biggest potential for impact in the next you know 10 to 20 years oh wow there i could give you a list of <laughs> some of these um closest to me in systems would be post silicon computing okay so uh, a lot of people have probably heard of moore's law it's not really a law. It's just an observation that the head of Intel made back in the 1960s about how rapidly computer chips were shrinking. And as they shrink, you can put more transistors on them. So we could put a few hundred transistors on a chip back when Moore made his observations. And the laptop that my wife bought last week has 7 billion transistors on one chip. <laughs> um, and we can't get them much smaller. We're basically at the end of this 40 year process or, or 60 year process of shrinking chips uh, because you know you can't make a wire that's skinnier than an atom wide <laughs> there's there's <laughs> physical limits on how far you can go and um and we use a huge amount of electricity to drive the machines that we have and they aren't as powerful as we'd like them to be ideally and we know that it's possible to do better because the human brain does better. And the human brain is like 10 pounds and consumes 15 watts, something <laughs> like that, right? 15 watts is a quarter of what my laptop consumes, right? And, and, and so we know it's possible to compute things much more efficiently than we do, but we don't know how. We don't know what to build them out of. It's not going to be silicon microchips. And... Uh, if we're going to get continued um, breakthroughs of the sort that we've gotten used to over the last couple of generations, we've got to figure out what comes next. It, it sounds like a good multidisciplinary uh, endeavor. Uh, oh, absolutely. It involves computer science and brain and cognitive science and biology and material science and optics for lithography, just everything you can think of. So I have two more questions, and it's more about you, uh, because while we do have prospective students uh, and, and parents, you know, watching this, we, we kind of understand how you got there, and you, you alluded to some of this before, but I, I want you to think about when you were a senior in high school, and like your idea of like becoming a professor, like what would surprise you the most, like 18-year-old you the most? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, maybe that I decided to become a professor. Um, when I was in high school, I was sure that I wanted to be a scientist, but uh, I didn't know in what field. And um, 
And I, I guess my mental image was that I would be in a company somewhere uh, working in a lab. Uh, when I finished my PhD, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to go into academia or industry. And, you know, I, I, I had offers from IBM and from some other companies, and I had offers from academic places. And uh, it was only actually in the process of interviewing that I, uh, I ended up convincing myself that I could be successful as a professor. Uh, so uh, it's a little bit of a surprise having ended up where I am. <laughs> I, I know you that you advise students. In, in my heart, I'm always an advisor. Uh, so I like hearing other people's advice. So you talked about which one of my, the, my favorite piece of advice is one you gave is that like, you know, study what you want uh, because, you know, that's where everything grows. I, I want to change it a little bit in terms of uh, what type of advice would you give like a prospective student after watching this uh, to get started on what, where they want to, what they want to do and where they want to go? Well, if they're in computing, mm -hmm. uh, because that is what we're talking about here today, uh, the intro courses in the department are a fairly easy decision, right? You, you figure out where you belong in the sequence. Not everybody takes 171. Students who have a strong programming background in high school will start in 172. A few start in 173. We have good placement procedures in place. And if you're admitted to the U of R, we will work with you to find the right place to start the program. So getting started in CS there is, is not a problem. Um, a pitfall that I see many students falling into is um, they're thinking only about their CS courses. And, uh, and I would point out that college is this incredible opportunity to sample. You've got this smorgasbord spread out in front of you of everything human beings think about and study. And you can take all of it. Well, you can't take all of it, <laughs> any of it that you want, right? You can pick and choose whatever you want. Um, it's an incredible lost opportunity. If you just put on the blinders and you say, what do the CS courses look like? Look around, see the other things, because you're going you're gonna to find them fascinating. You're going to end up applying computing to them. So look for those cool other things to take and, and, uh, and take some of them every semester along with your CS. That's excellent. And, and it, it's it's nice to know that uh, uh, we have faculty that want students to explore outside of the major and in the idea of making us, you know, well-rounded. Uh, Dr. Scott, I, I want to thank you for your insight and spending this time with us. Uh, I think it's really valuable for students to be able to hear this uh, and, and knowing the, the breadth of, of, of computer science and the opportunities. Cool. So, the Full Spectrum Series will return. Please feel free to share this video on behalf of the Hagem School. Thank you for watching, and we hope to see you soon.